Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the Cam Rogers Show on this hump day, November 1st, 2017. Can you believe it? We're into the month of November. The first CFP rankings have been released. We have our top four if the season were to end today. Don't worry, I'll get through those rankings. A little debrief session later in the show. I'm your host, Cam Rogers, coming at you live on Jack Sports, taking you up until 11 o'clock Eastern time. It's a kind of gloomy one here in Dallas, but I am as bright as can be because we have a very fun show on tap for you. We'll start off with the opening rant, as we always do, talking about the big-time trades across the National Football League. A lot of blockbusters, which is not typical of the NFL. I thought I was playing Madden for a second, seeing these big-time trades that were going on. So that will be a fun discussion. I'll go through the winners and losers both sides for these trades, and I will dissect them later. And coming up at 10.15 Eastern Time, we have Mr. Johnny Holiday, the voice of the Maryland Terrapins, who, of course, is the broadcaster for football, broadcaster for basketball there in College Park, as well as a very big name in DMV and really the United States. Really a fantastic career in his own right. Looking forward to chatting with him later in the show. After Johnny comes on, I'm talking about the CFB, the college football playoff rankings. They came out. I'll go through 25 all the way down to one. And then we'll do a little NFC team grades action. So we're at the midway point of the NFL season. I did my AFC team grades on Monday. Now it's going to do the NFC. Who's getting an A? Who's getting an F? I'll tell you one thing. Some teams are getting A's and some teams may be getting an F. So stay tuned for that. Then a final word on the Cleveland Browns and how they just essentially fumbled what could have been a really helpful trade for them. Almost acquired A.J. McCarron. That did not happen. I'll tell you why at the end of the show. But we are completely live here on the Cam Rogers Show, we want you commenting, reacting, throwing in your thoughts about the NFL trade deadline. Heck, maybe the Zeke Elliott situation looks like he is going to serve those six games this year. As well as throwing in your thoughts about the CFB rankings. A lot of controversy with Georgia at number one and Alabama number two. So certainly throw in your thoughts about that. We'll show up the comments throughout the broadcast as we see fit. And then finally, get the Cam Rogers Show on the go. Download the podcast version of this program. Search the Cam Rogers Show live. You'll see a picture of me doing this. Finger point. The classic move by yours truly. Download, subscribe, heck, leave a review. I would really appreciate that. Let's get into the meat of the program here. Talking about the NFL trade deadline. It ended yesterday, Halloween afternoon, if you will, 4 o'clock Eastern time. And we had bombshell after bombshell reports up until the waning moments of the deadline. So there are really four big time deals that I'm going to talk about. And we're going to start off with the one that broke late yesterday. So closer to four o'clock Eastern time than the other deals. Kelvin Benjamin, wide receiver formerly of the Carolina Panthers, was dealt to the Buffalo Bills in exchange for a third and seventh round pick respectively in the upcoming 2018 NFL draft. So the Buffalo Bills, a team that is clearly starving for a wide receiver, a big playmaker. Zay Jones still trying to find his rhythm. Jordan Matthews, I think the jury is out on him. Uh, you know, it, we really just have not seen good play from Mr. Matthews in the last couple of years. I don't think he's going to ever be that number one guy. And look, the Buffalo Bills have a fantastic run game. They are top 10 in rushing yards per game. Where was that big play threat down the field, though? Of course, they got rid of Sammy Watkins, and everybody thought, well, are the Buffalo Bills tanking in 2017? Here they stand as a premier contender in the NFL and the AFC, to be more exact, and they felt the need to go out, get a big-time player like Kelvin Benjamin, obviously somebody who is a big-time red zone threat, somebody that the Buffalo Bills have been lacking. Remember Scott Chandler back in the day? Remember everybody thought that guy was going to be the red zone threat for Buffalo? 6'7 tight end? Never happened. And ever since then, there really wasn't much noise about a real red zone threat for those Buffalo Bills. Although I could argue Charles Clay was a nice addition for them, but he went down earlier this year. 
So the winner of this trade, clearly the Buffalo Bills. The loser, the Panthers, and I'll put air quotes around loser. They did get a third and seventh round pick, respectively. The real loser here is Cam Newton, who now has Devin Funches as his number one receiver, and Curtis Samuel, who has not yet played to his expectations, to all of our expectations, if you will, graded poorly according to Pro Football Focus. So Cam Newton is going to be in trouble in the coming weeks because, first of all, it's clear he is going to be an inconsistent quarterback this year. Second of all, th that offense does not have an identity right now. They have this Christian McCaffrey guy that they really don't know how to use, and they have this Jonathan Stewart guy who's like the bruiser, and then they're trying this whole deep passing game deal with Devin Funches and Curtis Samuel, so it's not panning out. I am very confused in terms of Carolina's game plan, but I'm not confused about Buffalo. This is what Buffalo does. They run the football effectively. And now just imagine, folks, especially Bill's Mafia out there watching the Cam Rogers show right now. Picture the play action that the Buffalo Bills are going to be able to do now with Tyrod Taylor and LaShawn McCoy running the football effectively, a very good offensive line. And then all those fakes, you get the linebackers to suck up, you get that one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside, and you throw beautiful touchdown passes to Mr. Kelvin Benjamin. That is a deadly formula. The Buffalo Bills see an opportunity this year, folks. It may not be like years past, where, of course, the last time they started 5-2 was 2011. They didn't make the playoffs. This year could finally be the year that Buffalo gets back into the postseason. And they're going to look back on this day, October 31st, 2017, and say to themselves, Calvin Benjamin was the man who helped make it happen. Kelvin Benjamin to the Buffalo Bills, clearly a big-time move. So we have a weigh-in for you folks. We want you commenting and throwing in your thoughts about this. Can the Buffalo Bills actually win the AFC East now? Somebody tell me I'm crazy by saying the Buffalo Bills can actually win the AFC East. The Bills have yet to play the New England Patriots, which means they have the Patriots coming up twice. So that is going to be a big test for them. They have fantastic wins against Atlanta this year and Denver so that's a really good resume builder. They play tomorrow night at New York, playing the Jets. Obviously, AFC East games can go back and forth. You never really know what's going to happen. But here's the schedule coming up for them. It's kind of a gauntlet. I mean, you got the Saints, an upstart team, playing in Los Angeles, playing at Arrowhead. Then you got New England, the Colts, Dolphins twice, and then New England again at Foxborough on December 24th. Not necessarily in that order, but those are some of the notable games. So Buffalo, big time test for them, and Kelvin Benjamin could certainly turn the tide for them to beat these contender teams like the Patriots, like the Chiefs, like the Saints. So Buffalo Bills, big time schedule coming up for them. Next trade deadline move, Jimmy Garoppolo. This did not happen on Halloween. It happened the day before. But Garoppolo going to the San Francisco 49ers, look, it was time. It was finally time for Garoppolo to move on to a new team. It was clear, and my assumption is this, that Garoppolo wanted to move on. He wasn't going to sign another tender with the Patriots to stay there. Look at the play of quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Not very good. Jimmy Garoppolo is saying to himself, i got to get out there and be a starter. And he has been in Brady's shadow, if you will, for the last couple of years. So he's had an opportunity to learn things. And so I'm giving the 49ers the win here. The Patriots get a 2018 second rounder, which is sure great. But I think this is a big time move for San Francisco. I don't think CJ Beathard is the answer. Jimmy Garoppolo and Kyle Shanahan, that is going to be one deadly duo out there in the Bay Area. So I'm very excited to see when Jimmy Garoppolo will actually play Probably not this Sunday. Actually, I can essentially guarantee you it's not going to be this Sunday. But maybe in a couple of weeks, it's very possible he could start versus the Giants. Why not? So Jimmy Garoppolo there, big time move for the San Francisco 49ers. They get their quarterback of the future. Let's get into a, another big time move here. Jay Ajayi going to the Philadelphia Eagles. Look how quick the internet is. They already have Ajayi in with a uh, Philadelphia Eagles jersey. The Dolphins acquired a 2018 fourth rounder. And I gave this one a draw. I hope you people won't be mad out there that it's like kind of a cop-out saying that uh, this is a draw, no essential winner here. 
Because I think both sides actually won. Philadelphia gets a premier running back and Jay Ajayi, one of the best in yards after contact. Uh, historically, actually, one of the best. Meanwhile, the Dolphins, they're at a bit of a crossroads right now after getting blown out by the Baltimore Ravens. And really, Adam Gaze called out his offense and essentially said that uh, there will be moves. There will be changes. There's one change. Also, the Dolphins were shopping Jarvis Landry, too. So Adam Gaze is ready to make a bit of a transition there in the offense. So Jay Ajayi to the Philadelphia Eagles. What I'm really interested to see is how will Philadelphia divvy up these carries? So you still have LeGarrette Blunt, You still have Wendell Smallwood. Darren Sproles out for the year, so he's out. And then you insert Jay Ajayi. Ajayi is kind of like Blunt in, in that they're both goal line backs. But let me say this. And I think Frank Reich, who is the offensive coordinator, needs to understand that Jay Ajayi is a bell cow back. He is not a running back that should be getting less than 15 carries in a game. I don't care if LeGarrette Blunt uh, complains till the lights go out. Jay Ajayi needs his healthy dose. That's who he is. He got a healthy dose for Miami. He got a lot of work, a lot of opportunity, but the reality was the Dolphins' offensive line is 31st in run blocking, according to uh, football outsiders. So Ajayi obviously going to a much better offensive line in Philadelphia. Travis Kelsey there, Lane Johnson at right tackle. The loss of Jason Peters, obviously big, but it's way better than Miami. And I think Jay Ajayi is going to be really effective in this offense, so it's an opportunity for maybe the Eagles to really be a good cold weather team, not just a prolific passing offense with Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith, et cetera, but a good physical cold weather January type of team where you're running the football with Jay Ajayi and you're bruising opposing front sevens. So I say this is a draw because, again, uh, Philadelphia wins big time, but Miami has a chance to kind of reset here at running back. So with Jay Ajayi gone, you have Kenyon Drake and Damian Williams now. And not really sure what to expect out of these two running backs, but you have Kenyon Drake, who probably hasn't had a lot of opportunity. He's finally going to get that. So I think that's big for Miami's offense. Nice little draw there for Mr. Jay Ajayi, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Miami Dolphins, Kenyon Drake, etc. Dwayne Brown is my next one, my last little trade deadline deal here. Dwayne Brown going to the Seattle Seahawks for what was actually cornerback Jeremy Lane. He failed a physical, so it's now a third rounder, a fifth rounder, both in 2018, and a 2019 second rounder. So a lot of picks for the Houston Texans. I think that's a good thing for them. Meanwhile, Seattle, their offensive line is pathetically bad. Yeah, Dwayne Brown brings in a really good pro football focus grade from 2016. But the rest of the offensive line is terrible. Like, I'm not sure if just a good left tackle is going to change much for, Phil, or for Seattle. The run game is still not going to be where it needs to be. And yeah, sure, the left tackle is obviously the most important offensive line position really going to help Russell Wilson and probably give him more confidence to not run as wildly as he does when he has the football. But overall, I think the Texans win because they get a plethora of picks. And I think this is an opportunity for Houston to really cement itself as an AFC power because you got Deshaun Watson, you got DeAndre Hopkins, who is clearly loving Deshaun Watson, or Deshaun Watson right now. And an offensive line that can get better, and I think it can get better through the 2018 draft with that third round and fifth round pick, also in the 2019 draft with a second round pick. So I think the Houston Texans actually won this. Now, the Jeremy Lane situation was kind of sad because I thought it was a good opportunity for him to learn from Jonathan Joseph, a fantastic corner in Houston. Clearly not going to be the case because Jeremy Lane failed his physical. But still, I think the Texans win this deal. I don't think Dwayne Brown is going to move the needle too much for Seattle. So the winner, Houston Texans.
That's your trade deadline breakdown. This is the Cam Rogers Show, ladies and gentlemen. And we are presented by Mizzen in Maine. We're talking about advanced fabric shirts. Great for going out. Great for wearing to work. Beautiful dress shirts that are really comfortable. I'm not talking about crummy cotton that sticks to you and you sweat through it. This is moisture wicking technology. No dry cleaning needed. No ironing needed. Really a fantastic product. So we thank Mizzen in Maine for coming along on the Cam Rogers Show. Head on to their website, comfortable.af, because they are indeed comfortable as F. We're going to hit a quick break on the Cam Rogers Show. Coming up on the other side, we have Johnny Holiday coming on the program. Very excited for that conversation. Stick around. It's the Cam Rogers Show. Hey folks, welcome back to the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. I have Johnny Holiday on the program, the voice of the Maryland Terrapins for basketball and football. The Maryland Terps playing football right now, of course, searching for a bowl game possibility. Terps basketball, a lot of promise with them coming into this season as well. Johnny, thanks so much for coming on the program here. How are we doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me with you. Appreciate it. And there's a lot to talk about, as always, with Terps sports in general let's start with football here where the Terps simply can't catch a break at quarterback Johnny first off it was Tyrell Pigram getting hurt he went down then Kasim Hill looked like a lot of promise with the freshman he went down as well let me ask you about Maryland overall and how they've been able to kind of battle that adversity at the quarterback position and still racking up a good amount of wins so far what are your thoughts well, I think that the, the entire story revolves, as you just mentioned, Cam, around the quarterbacks. I don't think any team in the country, no matter who they are, Ohio State or Alabama or Wisconsin or Penn State, if you, if you lose your number one quarterback, you're in trouble. If you lose your number two quarterback, you're also in, in deeper trouble. And then when you're playing with your number three guy, it's like roll the dice. You have no idea what to expect. And Max Wartenschlager, who's the number three guy on the depth chart, now he's the number one guy on the depth chart, has done a pretty good job, all things considered. He didn't expect to play much this year. Uh, when you're number three and you got two terrific guys ahead of you, both young guys, one's a sophomore in Pigram and one's a freshman in Kasim Hill, so you're kind of just relegated yourself to uh, working a little bit in practice, not getting a lot of reps with the first unit at all, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into the fire, and it's kind of like learning under baptismal, really. And he's, I think he's done a terrific job, all things considered. Uh, he's been uh, protected pretty good by the offensive line, and I think they've simplified the offense, Cam, to kind of work what's best for him. Uh, they don't want to tr have him try to do too much. He's, a, he's got a good arm. He, he, he doesn't like to run that much because he hasn't had that much experience. But he can take off when he has to. He's got some good running backs to give the ball off to. So I think to be in a situation they're in now, to be 4-4 four and four at this stage of the season, and if you win the game against Rutgers on Saturday, uh, that's a 5-4 and four record. Then you only have to steal one of the remaining three games to get yourself that bowl-eligible uh, mantle. But those three games are going to be mighty tough. Michigan, Michigan State, and Penn State. But you asked D.J. Durkin about uh, that, he'll you know, deflect the question off to, well, we're not worried about that. You know, most coaches would say we're concerned about the next game. That's it, and that'll be Rutgers on Saturday. 
You're absolutely right. After Rutgers, it's quite a gauntlet for the Maryland Terrapins. You talked about Bortenschlager a little bit there, Johnny. Let me ask you this. Talk about the transition that was really needed in terms of offensive mentality when you go from Pigram to Hill, all of a sudden the Bortenschlager, because it's safe to say that Max isn't exactly the mobile quarterback that, say, Kasim Hill is. So that probably took a lot of schematic changes, if you will, in Maryland's offense, probably more reliance on a Ty Johnson, a Lorenzo Harrison, if you will. Well, I, I think the biggest problem, they, not the biggest problem, the biggest adjustment they had to make was because Pegram is a, is a very shifty, elusive runner as a quarterback. He's very good. Kasim Hill had the whole package. He was probably penciled in to be the number one guy in time here at Maryland. He can run. He can throw. He had command of the offense. He's, he's a much bigger kid than Pigram is. So you got a threat there of a guy that can throw the ball and run the ball. But now you've got a threat of basically making sure Max doesn't make any mistakes. And I think that's what they've done to limit his, I guess, potential of being a real, real good quarterback. Just make it very, very simple for him. They've relied more on the running game, which I think you have to do, and why not? I mean, you got guys like Ty Johnson, you got Lorenzo Harrison, and you know those guys are pretty tough to nail down when they get the ball. You've got one of the best receivers in the country in D.J. Moore, if you can get the ball to him. He's got 29 consecutive games with having caught at least one pass. But, you know, Burton Schlager against Ohio State, uh, he, he, it was a tough day against Ohio State. Against Northwestern, he had one of his better games. He threw 255 yards. And then last week uh, against Indiana, he didn't have such a good game, but he kept it within, uh, you know, what they want to do. And they were able to hold on in, a, in a, just a tremendous shootout here at College Park to win that game 42-39. to 39. So um, I think hats off to Max. He's a great kid from Fishers, Indiana. Uh, and I, I think everybody's pulling for him. They really want him to do well. And I think his teammates have rallied around him. They want to they want to play the best they can to protect him, to make sure he's not flattening his back the entire game, and that uh, he's got time to throw the football, too. Well, of course, I'm pulling for my Maryland Terrapins as well this season. Johnny, I got my Maryland red on, although it is a Nike polo, so just don't tell Kevin Plank if you can do me a favor in that regard there. But I won't I will... tell him, yeah. <laughs> I will ask you this about that schedule coming up. Of course, Rutgers. And then, you know, Michigan has shown some flashes of struggles, especially on the offensive side. Penn State, you'll, you'll wonder their motivation at the uh, end of the year in that final game. It's going to be tough to get bowl eligible, but if you had to open up your crystal ball a little bit here, Johnny, do you think they can get there? I would say yes. I would say that somewhere in those three games, they're going to pull an upset. Uh, they've gotten better each game, even though they lost to Northwestern. They lost. That's pretty. That's a pretty tough stretch they had. They had Ohio State. You had Northwestern. You had Wisconsin. Two of those games were on the road. And it's tough to win at Ohio State. Tough to even win at Wisconsin. But I think coming back here after this game against Rutgers, should they get this one on Saturday, they're five and four, and they know exactly what they have to do. And, and Michigan is a a game they will have no trouble getting up for because that's where D.J. Durkin came from as the defensive coordinator there. So there's a little bit more of a motivational factor there to, to win that game, not for the team, but maybe a little bit of motivation to win it for Coach Durkin, for uh, the team that he coached for. He was very, very successful as their defensive coordinator. The Michigan State game, who knows? I mean, you got to go there, and they're awfully tough to beat there. Then coming back against Penn State, you got a pretty tough customer there, James Franklin, the former assistant coach at Maryland, who would have probably been the head coach had he stayed here and not, uh, you know, jump ship to go down to to uh, Tennessee and to Vanderbilt. And uh, so that's going to be another motivational thing. But I think uh, stranger things have happened, and we'll just have to wait and see. There you have it. Let's transition a little to. The court, if you will, Johnny, talking about Terps basketball. Now in an era where there is no mellow Trimble, which obviously is going to take some adjusting, how do you see Maryland's offense shaking out this year with a new era of star players there? Well, I think without mellow Trimble, it's going to be a whole different team, Cam. you got Colin coming back, who will be the point guard. You've got Justin Jackson. He'll shift over to a, like a stretch four. 
and you've got Kevin Herter, who's going to be playing his natural position. He's a guard, a big, big kid as a guard. And all three of these guys have got tremendous, tremendous potential. I think it's going to be as good or perhaps even better of a team, a more balanced team this year than what we saw last year. You know, they won a lot of games last year. Uh, they won 24 ball games, and they, they only lost, I think they lost four or five games at home. And they came in tied for second in the Big Ten. <laughs> Excuse me, they got off to a great start. They were like 20-2. and two, But they relied so much on Melo Trimble to make that last shot when it was necessary to win a game or, or, or tie a game or, or get close in a very crucial situation. They always looked for Melo. Well, he's not there anymore. So now it's like Cowan's team to run, and they've got depth, they've got experience, they've got 10 guys that lettered last year on this basketball team. They've also got some good freshmen coming in, too. This kid from Baltimore, uh, Daryl Marcel, is, is a terrific, terrific backup guard, and uh, yeah, he'll eventually move into a starting spot as he continues along. So I think it's going to be a heck of a good team. I know Mark's looking forward to it. Uh, they've made three consecutive trips to the NCAA tournament, and they've just made their mark in the Big Ten. They, you know, they won 38 games over the last three years, and they lost. Uh, you know, you lose Trimble, you lose Demonte Dodd, you lose LG Gill, but uh, I think they've got so much firepower coming back. It'll be balanced, a more balanced team, I think, and they're not going to have to rely upon one guy as much as they did last year in Melo Trimble. If anything, I think the guy's probably going to be Kevin Herter and Justin Jackson as their number one and two guys that they're going to go to this year. You know, Johnny, I think I'm going to be kind of straight up with this regard here. I think we actually might get pretty spoiled with some good guard play from Maryland this year with Kevin Herter and Anthony Cowan. I want to ask you, how excited are you to see those two go at it with each other and uh, score some points for the Terps? Well, I think judging by what they did last year, Cam, both of them were, they didn't play like they were freshmen. But Cowan had played at St. John's College High School here. He'd gone through some great competition. When you play Gonzaga, you play Georgetown Prep, you play DeMatha. So he's played some big, big games. And Justin Jackson came down from Canada, and he, he played way, way beyond his years. And one thing about Justin, he went to the NBA uh, combine, the uh, NBA Combines this year, where you go and you don't sign with an agent, just to kind of test the waters and see how good he was coming off his freshman year. Everybody knew he was going to come back to Maryland, but he said he learned an awful lot in those combines and those camps that he went to different ball clubs with. So I think he's got tremendous upside. Kevin Herter is, I think, a coach's dream. You know, his dad played at Siena, and he just, he's got such a great high IQ when it comes to basketball. Probably one of the smartest guys in the team, and he knows that he's going to take it upon himself to be more of a leader this year than he was last year. Kind of a quiet kid last year, but now he knows he has to be a little bit more vocal with some of these young guys they got coming along. And I think those three guys, and you toss in the mix Michael Tchaikovsky, who had to play hurt most of last year, and he broke his ankle at, at Wisconsin, and that finished him for the rest. I think he only played 17 games out of the entire schedule last year. But he's a kid 7-2 in the, in the, in the post. you got Evan Bender, another big kid off the bench. you got Sean Obey, who's in grad school. Uh, remember that Duke National Championship uh, chip team a couple of years ago, even though he didn't play that much, and transferred to Duke from Rice. So you got some guys coming in with, with some great experience. And then you throw Morsel in there uh, from Mount St. Joseph's up in Baltimore. And they're going to go probably, I think Mark's going to rely upon maybe nine guys, but then he's got a bench that you can count on with Nickens and Deion Wiley coming off the bench and even Bender. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting season. We're going to find out more tomorrow night. They play an exhibition game against Randolph-Macon. And uh, so they got three starters back. you got Ted Letterman coming back and a team that got to the NCAA again. And they, they expect him to do the same thing this year. And the Terps kicking off their season against Stony Brook. Looking forward to opening night, if you will. Johnny, of course, will be on that call. Johnny, to wrap up the conversation here, we always like to get to know our guests a little more on the personal level as well as the analytical level with the sports they're talking about. So I did a little research, and from what I understand, you were quite the award-winning actor back in the day. Of course, you were known for your role in the musical Me and My Girl. I got to ask you, how was that experience? 
Oh, that was pretty good. I, I enjoy. I miss it very much. With uh, with baseball coming along, with the Nationals, I haven't got a chance to do much theater, but I, I started doing summer shows uh, just to kind of publicize the radio show that I was doing. I was doing a morning show on radio, and uh, my first professional show was Phineas Rainbow back in Cleveland. And then uh, since that time, I guess I've done over 20 or 25 musicals over the years. But I really enjoyed it. I, I really miss it. Uh, you know, when you got to learn a script and learn songs, learn choreography, it's a challenge, unlike what you're doing with calling a football game or a basketball game or doing baseball. And I enjoyed it very much. I, I enjoyed the acting part of it, the memorization. Uh, it was one show I was doing called Same Time Next Year. And there's only two people. It's me and there's her. And there's no, there's no uh, chorus to come on to bail you out and let you go off stage and check a script and see where you're going to go next. So it's just you and her for two, uh, two and a half hours. And I was in rehearsal one day, and there was about, I guess it's probably four or five pages of dialogue just for me in this show. I, I got so frustrated. You know, they called. I stopped the rehearsal. I said, I just can't get I can't get this. I can't, I, there's four pages I have to memorize. I, and we, we're going to open the show, I think, the next week. So I went home from rehearsal, and I came back the next day, and it was a lot better. And, of course, I got I got the role down, and I knew exactly what I was doing. But then later on, and I reflect back to that, and you're thinking when you're doing a television ball game, and the producer in your ear says, it's like you, Cam, if they say to you, okay, you got to keep talking for another two minutes. Sure and you've already learned five pages of dialogue, it's a piece of cake. So acting really, for me, helped me in the broadcasting side of things as well. And so any any challenge that you have in broadcasting, you've already had it on the stage, and there's nothing that can compare the two, really. Johnny Holiday, ladies and gentlemen, a man of many talents coming on the Cam Rogers Show today. Johnny, I know your schedule is very busy, so I really do appreciate you coming on the program. Wish you all the best the rest of the year. Cam, thank you very much, and it's very nice to be with you, too. Let's keep our fingers crossed for your therapist, because you went to Maryland, didn't you? You're exactly right. Just graduated in 2017, so go Terps, huh? Yeah, so you're pulling for them on Saturday, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. That's okay. I'll be sure to tell Dirk in that. <laughs> I appreciate that, Johnny. Take care. All right, Cam. All right, Johnny Holiday jumping on the Cam Rogers Show. Really cool guy. A man of many talents. As we remind you, we are presented by Mizzen in Maine. You know what they say on their website about these fantastic advanced fabric shirts? 22nd century level stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Not just 21st. 22nd century level. No ironing needed. No dry cleaning needed. These are fantastic products. And I'm not just talking about shirts. A little denim action. You can buy some hats on their website as well. www.comfortable.af is their website because they are indeed comfortable as F. And one more thing, they're made in America too. So hashtag America. Many thanks to Miz and Amane for coming along on the Cam Rogers Show today. So good conversation there with Johnny Holiday. It was a really fun uh, discussion about the Maryland Terrapins. We'll see what they do in the basketball season and the football season as they wrap up this year. And CFB is essentially kind of wrapping up, guys. Like, we're getting towards the end of the season, and we're starting to talk about playoffs. Playoffs? Yeah, exactly. So the first rankings came out yesterday night, uh, and we revealed them right here on Chat Sports. Had a fun conversation, fun broadcast. Tom Downey, Jordan Giorgio, James Yoder, our Michigan Football Insider, Broke it all down for you. We'll do it again next week, Tuesday, 7 o'clock Eastern time, so stay tuned for that. But, yes, the rankings came out, and, of course, a lot of storylines that come along with it. Georgia now at number one. Clemson gets in there at number four. Alabama at number two, a point of controversy for some of the pundits out there. Notre Dame with an impressive season so far this year in there at number three. So we have the bracket for you. Let's show you the top six here. As I said, Georgia undefeated this season. So what this tells me with the fact that Georgia is ahead of Alabama, there is essentially a higher regard for resume than, say, just, you know, brand name and your record just, you know, in a blank slate, if you will. 
So that's what's the difference between the committee and the CFP and the AP poll. Because the AP poll is consensus Alabama number one. So this was a big time change from what we were used to. A lot of the projections were, of course, Alabama being at number one. But Georgia now at number one. If the season were to end today, that's what would go down. Georgia battling Clemson, Alabama taking on Notre Dame. That would be a fun one. There's Oklahoma at number five on the outside looking in as well as Ohio State. So there you have it right there. What's really interesting about Georgia, they're going to be playing Alabama in the SEC championship game. So all of the controversy at this point really is for not because we're at a point where we're going to figure out who's the better of the two teams when they play in the SEC championship. Georgia out of the East, of course. So really the idea, idea that we have to argue that Georgia should not be number one and Alabama should be number one instead, it's just kind of a waste of time and it's a waste of energy because again, we're gonna get that test when these two duke it out in the SEC championship game. More points of controversy probably would be with who gets in at number four? Because I do believe that Georgia and Alabama are going to get in, no matter what happens in the SEC championship game. Some people are trying to argue that Alabama, if they lose against Georgia in the SEC championship, that they might not make the college football playoff at all. Whereas they might get jumped by a Clemson, especially Clemson wins the ACC championship game, or maybe in Oklahoma if they finish strong. Don't count out Ohio State if they win the Big Ten championship. Will the committee weigh that over Alabama if, the, if Alabama and the Crimson Tide lose the SEC championship game? I don't think that's going to happen. I think if Alabama loses against Georgia in that championship game, they're going to get in. I mean, it would be absolutely crazy if they did not. So, you know, I think Alabama and Georgia both are safe. I think Notre Dame is safe for now. They have to continue winning, and Brian Kelly knows it, the head coach there. I mean, this is essentially playoffs for them right now, being an ind independent team. They don't have a championship game where they can impress the committee. So Notre Dame there at number three. Clemson at four is very interesting because Ohio State just came back and beat Penn State. And obviously, you know, Ohio State, if they lost to Penn State, they'd be much lower. But I think Ohio State probably should be at number four in my eyes. I really do. I think we can really look at this team and say, okay, JT Barrett now in the Heisman conversation, a good run game, a defensive front seven that probably is the best collective position group in all of college football. I think Ohio State only is going to rise. And I think the Buckeyes and all the fans out there in Columbus are rooting for the Hurricanes of Miami to stun Clemson in the ACC championship game. And if Ohio State wins the Big Ten championship game, Ohio State's in, Clemson's out, Miami's just missing out on the outside looking in. That's right. There is a scenario where Miami continues to win, they win the ACC championship game, and they get jumped by a one-loss Ohio State team. It's just the way it is. You look at the Big Ten, you look at the ACC, I think the Big Ten's a little more of a gauntlet. I mean, ACC's still tough, they still have Virginia Tech, etc., but I think the Big Ten is held in higher regard if I am putting my mind into that of the committee right now. So there is your bracket as we stand. Of course, things may change as we have a wild college football Saturday coming up. So very excited for this Saturday. Let's take a look at the other rankings here. 25 down, Washington State at number 25. There's Michigan State, Memphis at 23. Riley Ferguson and Norvell there, the head coach, having a great season. Arizona, Khalil Tate at quarterback. Who would have thought Arizona would be ranked this year? Arizona had no respect going into this season. Both Arizonas, Arizona State and Arizona. Arizona State playing pretty well as well. Stanford there at number 21 with Bryce Love missing the most recent game for them. They're at 6-2. Let's go to 20 through 16. NC State, the Wolfpack. I'm just saying, NC State has had a really good season. I think they can be disruptive in the ACC. They have no playoff chance or anything like that, but they can be disruptive. LSU at number 19, good little resurgence by them when people were calling for Ed Orgeron's head, if you will, at one point this season. Iowa State at 15 uh, as we revisit the USC, number 17 rank. Mississippi State there at 16. So, you know, Mississippi State, we expected them to be ranked again. 
Uh, they had really some good recent performances, crushed A&M recently, so Mississippi State there at number 16. Checking with 15 through 11 now, oh, Iowa State, as I mentioned, we knew they would probably be inside the top 15. You could probably make an argument that the Cyclone should be at maybe 12 or 11, honestly. But there they are at 6-2, and two. Uh, really a fantastic year. What Matt Campbell has done with that team is absolutely amazing to me, and watching that locker room speech by Campbell after that victory over TCU. It made me want to go outside and run sprints. Like, honestly, it was that powerful. Virginia Tech at number 13. I'm saying there's a chance for the Hokies to actually get a playoff berth. An outside shot. They got to roll the table, obviously, and get into the ACC championship game, win the ACC and all that. But just saying there is a chance. There's Washington at number 12 in the Pac-12. And then Oklahoma State, the Bedlam Bowl on Saturday, they're battling the Sooners. If Oklahoma State beats the Sooners, oh my gracious, guys, the Big 12 would be chaotic. Because, of course, you have Oklahoma State as an 8-1 and one team. Oklahoma now is a two-loss team. TCU recently lost to Iowa State. Iowa State getting it done at 6-2. and two. Who the heck knows what's going to happen with the Big 12? So there's Oklahoma State at 11. Let's check in with 10 through 7. Miami could very well be Ohio State's best friend there at number 10. Wisconsin, 8-0, but no respect from the committee there at number 9. As we go through these rankings, folks, throw in your thoughts. I see some comments flowing in about Ohio State, Penn State, etc. So we'll be showing them throughout the broadcast. TCU at 7-1, tough loss against Iowa State. That was in, in Ames. And then at number 7, Penn State. Seven and one, and I mentioned this with Johnny, you have to wonder what the Nittany Lions' motivation will be in that final game against Maryland. Will Penn State be essentially out of the playoff race at that point? Who knows? Uh, but, of course, they're going to be playing hard. They want to get to that Big Ten championship game and hopefully pose some sort of resume to the committee to tell them that they can get in to the college football playoff. Friendly reminder again, we will be revealing a fresh batch of college football playoff rankings next Tuesday, 7 o'clock Eastern time here on Chat Sports. Really successful show last night. Fun watching Giorgio, Yoder, and Downey getting it all done. So fun program coming at you next week as we roll on with the Cam Rogers Show. That was your college football playoff debrief. Hey, folks, Cam Rogers here. Follow me on Twitter at MrRogers99. No D in Rogers, not like Aaron Rodgers, like the Mr. Rogers with the sweater. So toss me a follow. We are indeed presented by Mizzen and Maine. Fantastic performance fabric shirts. I'm talking about sweat-wicking technology. That is right up my alley as someone who wears clinical strength deodorant. It's a fantastic product. Mizzen and Maine, thank you so much for taking away those pit stains. Great product. Check them out, comfortable.af, because they are indeed comfortable as F. So, Mizzen and Maine, sponsoring the Cam Rogers Show here today. All right, guys, so we did the AFC grades on Monday. We are at the midway point of the NFL season. That's why I'm doing this. So, we got to do the NFC grades. So, let's bring them up. We'll start with the Dallas Cowboys, America's team, if you will. Here's the record. They're at 4-3, and three, and I think the real big story for them right now is the Zeke Elliott suspension it's going to go down. So Zeke is going to be suspended for these next six games. And the Dallas Cowboys are going to have a situation where they're going to have to divvy up carries with Alfred Morris and kind of have a committee-type approach with Darren McFadden as well. I still think they'll be able to run the football effectively, uh, but not obviously as well as they would with Zeke. But that's not the point here. The point here is Zeke's intangibles, Zeke's ability to pass protect Zeke's intelligence within the offense that's what really concerns me about the Dallas Cowboys so here's their grade so far they have a B I'm giving them a B at this point they've had some pretty bad games this year where their secondary has had uh, some issues shall we say it nicely and still at four and three I think they're still in the hunt in the NFC East although they have to get rolling big time they have to beat the Philadelphia Eagles twice basically to really have a shot at the NFC East this year. They have yet to play the Philadelphia Eagles. But uh, back to the Zeke deal, he's going to be done for these next six games because, well, the court just ruled down on his TRO request for an appeal and all that. So 
really, it's really making my brain turn into mush about the whole legal jumbo, if you will. But suffice it to say that Zeke will not be playing for these next six games. I will say this. It is nice to see the Dallas Cowboys with a pretty darn good pass rush. Tyron Crawford, Demarcus Lawrence, they have been a fantastic duo on that defensive line. And both highly graded according to Pro Football Focus. So the Dallas Cowboys, they're getting a B from me. They're still in the playoff hunt. I still think they have a shot at the NFC East. But if they don't make the playoffs at all, point to this six-game stretch here, folks, with Zeke out. I want you guys, all you Dallas Cowboys fans out there, to watch the tape in these upcoming games. When teams blitz against, against the Cowboys, can McFadden and can Morris hold up in pass protection and pick up those blitzes? Because I don't know if they can. Certainly not as good as Zeke can. All right, so Dallas with a B. How about an F grade? The New York Football Giants. Playoff appearance last year, only lost five games. They've lost six already through seven. They're one and six. The run game is pathetic. There is no offensive lineman graded above 60, according to Pro Football Focus so far for the Giants. Really a disappointing year for them. And I kind of have, like, really a small, very, like, minuscule fandom for the Giants because I, I like to see them play well. I think they're a fun team to watch. I like how their pass rush and you know their Super Bowl runs has been fantastic in that run game with Tiki Barger, Barber back in the day, etc. Now all of that is gone. Janoris Jenkins suspended. Ben McAdoo can't control the locker room. And we're at this point where even Eli Manning was essentially in trade talks and I tried predicting that he was going to go to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Can you imagine if that actually went down? Uh, but for the Giants, it's just not a fun team to watch right now. When you can't run the football, you can't control the line of scrimmage, you're giving up plays in the passing game. I mean, all of that just falls in line with a 1-6 and six record. It is amazing to me that the Giants actually beat the Denver Broncos in Denver on Sunday Night Football. Maybe that just points to the fact that the Broncos are just a fraudy team. But the Giants, they get an F for me. Really bad season so far, and it's only going to get worse in my eyes. So there are the Giants there. Let's move on to a team that deserves a big fat A. The Philadelphia Eagles with perhaps the favorite to win coach of the year in Doug Peterson. 7-1 record so far. Carson Wentz has been stellar. They have an elite front four with Jernigan, Graham, Fletcher Cox that creates many opportunities in that secondary. And really a secondary that is kind of actually overperformed when I looked at it closer. You know, overall, the secondary doesn't have a lot of talent in terms of brand name, but Jalen Hills has actually been serviceable there, corner. They're creating opportunities in the secondary, creating turnovers, thanks in part to that front four and the ability to get after the passer. So for the Philadelphia Eagles, now acquiring Jay Ajayi, this is a team that is going to be a force in the NFC. So they get an A from me. Wrapping up the NFC East here, Washington Redskins. They're three and four. They've suffered injuries with Josh Norman. Trent Williams has been hurt on that left side, did not play the most recent game. Kirk Cousins clearly does not have a lot of chemistry with his wide receivers, most notably um, Pryor there, Terrell Pryor. So you have to insert Jamison Crowder as that number one guy, and he's just not a tall, big receiver that can make many plays down the field. So with that, you have the Redskins at a C-plus grade. They've had some injuries to the defense as well. It's just kind of been a little bit of a bad luck situation. And overall, I think the Redskins will probably finish around an 8-8, eight 7-9 and eight, seven and nine type deal. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. But I will give them that little plus there because I like the way in which that defense has done on third down, which was a big concern for them last year. They were awful on third down defense, much better this year. But Kirk Cousins looks like he's not going to San Francisco now. So if he's going to stay in Washington, he's going to need a big-time receiver on the outside, a physical player, a tall player, heck, someone reminiscent of a Calvin Benjamin. So Washington Redskins there wrapping up the NFC East. Let's check in with the NFC South. Hey, talking about fraud teams, the Atlanta Falcons. You Atlanta Falcons fans out there, you're lucky I'm giving you a C right now. This team is, like, weird. They're 4-3, and three, sure, that's fantastic, but they've lost three of their last four most notably in Foxborough against the Patriots, where they looked hapless and pathetic. Also at home against the Buffalo Bills. The Atlanta Falcons looked actually pretty bad against the Jets, nearly lost that one. <clears throat> that one, excuse me. And so for the Atlanta Falcons right now, I am not really sure where we're headed. This is a team where 
I really don't understand what their offensive identity is. I know they want to create plays down the field with Julio Jones. I know they want to be a physical run team sometimes too. But the offense, in my eyes, just has not gelled. Kind of like with the Washington Redskins, a team that you know is devoid of chemistry. And I, I, you saw some good plays from Mohamed Sanu last week. That's good to see. But overall, Atlanta, get to see from me. Coming off a season where they were fantastic, made it to the Super Bowl, 28-3, to we all know. But coming into this year with 4-3 and three record so far, eh, that's a C grade. How about the Carolina Panthers here staying in the NFC South? B-plus grade for me. I'm thinking this might be a little generous, but I'm going to stick with it. They're at 5-3. and three. They traded away Calvin Benjamin to the Buffalo Bills, of course, for a third and seventh round pick, respectively. I'm thinking this off year for Cam Newton is going to continue, guys. Devin Funches, Greg Golson's going to start practicing, or I believe he already has started practicing, but it's going to take some time for him to get back into the fold. Curtis Samuel, eh, McCaffrey that they're not really using right. Like Cam Newton, you know, putting fantasy questions aside, I mean, there were a lot of them going into this year. Just him on the field, he's been inconsistent. His decision-making has been a problem. He's been immature with the media, Cam, putting a bad name to the Cam name. Uh, there's been a problem in Carolina right now. But with all that said, they're 5-3. and three. They're at least winning games. Luke Keekley back after an injury a couple weeks ago. Nice to see him there. Made a nice play against the, against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers most recently. We'll get to them in a minute. So I think as long as that defense continues to hold strong, they can get to that 9-7, and 10-6 and six range and maybe make a push in the NFC South. But I think another team is actually going to win that division. We'll get to that team as well later. But let's get to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the NFC's biggest disappointment, guys. Look, a D grade for me, 2-5 and five at this point. They were a sexy pick to maybe get a wild card in the NFC. Did not happen, is not going to happen. Jameis Winston, that AC joint injury is clearly a problem. The Buccaneers only mustered three points last week at home against Carolina. They are the Raiders of the NFC, it's safe to say. The, defense, the defensive secondary has been a problem. The front seven overall has actually been pretty weak as well. Devontae David, you know what you'll get from him. He's a good linebacker. And Gerald McCoy, great on the defensive front. But everywhere else, it's bad. They're not creating enough turnovers. They're turning the football over too much. Jameis Winston, clearly not 100%. Heck, when you throw around the name Ryan Fitzpatrick as a potential starter because Winston is hurt, that's when the red flags should come out. And I think they are out already. Tampa Bay Buccaneers get a D from me. Checking in with the New Orleans Saints now, the team that I think will actually win this division, 5-2 and two record. Guys, did anybody expect Marshall and Lattimore to be the NFL's top cornerback? Like, did any draft pro no prognosticator say that Marshawn Lattimore was going to be the number one guy? Because he is, according to Pro Football Focus right now. The Saints are, of course, the NFC's biggest surprise. A defense that was awful last year has played much better this season. They're creating turnovers. Cam Jordan is getting after the quarterback. He has an elite grade in his own right on the uh, Saints defense there, along with Marshawn Lattimore. And so you have that coupled with Drew Brees still playing out of his mind. Michael Thomas, Ted Ginn with a bit of a resurgence coming out of nowhere, playing well for the Saints. This is a team to be reckoned with, guys. I think they can actually win in cold weather, too. Not just domes and in L.A., et cetera. This is a team that can run the football and be physical with Mark Ingram. And Kamara is a nice little spark plug as well. Saints there in the NFC South. I think they win that division. They have an A-minus from me. Breezing along here, let's get to the NFC North Chicago Bears. Not going to say much about them. They got a C-minus grade from me. Three and five. That defense is something to build around. Amos there at the safety position. Akeem Hicks has been fantastic. Loss of Zach Miller, though. Thoughts go out to him. Really tough situation. Nearly lost his uh, entire leg. Uh, it was one of those situations where I got the update on my phone and I had to do a double take because I was like, wait a minute, what? So I've never seen something like that. So, Zach Miller, our, our hearts go out to you, my friend. Hopefully you get better there. So, Chicago Bears, they're at a C-minus grade. How about the Green Bay Packers? They get a C with a little asterisk, if you will. Aaron Rodgers out. Don't know when he's going to be back. But I think they found their running back in Mr. Aaron Jones. This guy is something special. So Aaron Jones, the fantasy running back to own for the Green Bay Packers. Ty Montgomery, eh, maybe he should go back to wide receiver or something. I don't know. Green Bay, C grade for me. Minnesota Vikings, A grade. They are among the NFL's elite guys. When you have a quarterback named Case Keenum, 
and you're still winning games. That is fantastic. Top-down elite defense. Harrison Smith, Linval Joseph, uh, Everson Griffin. Fantastic playmakers on that defense. They are going to be around in the NFL to the bitter end. Dare I say it, if Teddy Bridgewater gets back, Super Bowl aspirations for this team. Detroit Lions, they get a D-plus from me. We'll check in with them as they have a 3-4 and four record. They are actually creating a lot of turnovers, the Lions are. They're third in the NFL. But the run game has been absent. As always, Amir Abdullah, Theo Riddick not getting it done. Detroit Lions look hapless against the Pittsburgh Steelers on Sunday Night Football. So they get a D-plus grade from me. Let's go out west, ladies and gentlemen. The Arizona Cardinals, again, kind of an asterisk situation. Carson Palmer. Looks like he's not going to be back this year. He might not be back at all, guys, in terms of coming back to the NFL. They've got a brutal offensive line that has been hit with a lot of injuries. Poor in pass protection, poor in run blocking, and now you have Drew Stanton in at the quarterback position. The Arizona Cardinals get a D+. I thought this was a team that actually could contend for a Super Bowl this year. I was really impressed with their defense coming into this season. We know what they can do in the secondary with Peterson and the Honey Badger there. But overall, the Cardinals have been a disappointment. And look, you can't forget about David Johnson going out as well. Obviously, a big-time loss for them. And it looks like he's not coming back either. Bruce Arians said something along the lines of probably not going to return because of that wrist injury. So obviously, a tough situation for Cardinals fans. They get a D+. Plus. How about an F grade, though? The Niners, you're 0-8, but you know what? The grass is greener. The grass is greener, ladies and gentlemen. They traded for Jimmy Garoppolo. That Shanahan-Garoppolo duo, I think, is going to be deadly for years to come. Kyle Shanahan has a complex offense because there are a lot of changes at the line of scrimmage that Jimmy G is going to have to learn, but I think he will learn them effectively. I think he'll be a fantastic quarterback out west in the Bay Area for the 49ers. This is a team, though, with pieces on defense that can that the 49ers can build around, especially DeForest Buckner. He is an elite defensive lineman, ladies and gentlemen. Watch out for him in the years to come. But as we stand right now, the Niners are winless. So with that, uh, they get an F. So there you go. Winless 49ers there with an F grade. How about the Seattle Seahawks? They get an A- minus from me. 5-2 and two record. It was a rough first month, and then they really started to turn it on. Russell Wilson is having a career year so far. But I think this is something to monitor with the Seattle Seahawks. They're giving up plays in the secondary. Earl Thomas now has a hamstring injury. Richard Sherman is in elite corner right now. If you want to go by pro football focus grades, he's not cutting it. So keep that in mind as we continue these games. Seattle just got shredded by Deshaun Watson in Seattle. So stay tuned for the Seahawks. Let's see if they can bounce back in that defensive secondary. Finally, the Los Angeles Rams. What a surprise team, guys. 5-2 and two record. Jared Goff, his development has been fantastic. Not quite to the level of Carson Wentz, but really playing good football. We just need, and I'm talking from a Rams fan perspective, more help from Woods, more help from Watkins on the outside if they do want to be that team to get it done in the playoffs. They have a shot to get to the playoffs, maybe as a wild card, but for the Rams right now, they got to get more plays. Todd Gurley is doing right now. I love that offensive line. It's serviceable. Jared Goff, etc. That defense too with Aaron Donald. That's why they have an A minus. But I'm just saying at this point, have not gotten a lot of production out of the wide receivers. So stay tuned for that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 23, LeBron James edition of the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. No time to get into the final word. It was about the Cleveland Browns and how they messed up a trade because they couldn't get the paperwork in on time. They tried to get A.J. McCarron, and it didn't happen. Classic Browns. This has been the Cam Rogers Show. Get the podcast on iTunes. Search the Cam Rogers Show. I will see you Friday morning. Until then, peace out.